Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Baruch Performing Arts Center. I'm Ted Altshuler, director here at BPAC, which is made up of two intimately scaled performance spaces on 25th Street between 3rd and Lexington Avenues. We present a season that invites the Baruch College community and all New York culture lovers to experience performing art across many genres and cultures with an emphasis on the way that the arts can bring topics of social justice to light. The idea for this Art Speaks Justice segment on the politics of race was prompted by a music theater piece entitled DWB, short for Driving While Black. And in case it's not familiar to you, this phrase references the unequal number of traffic stops by law enforcement that African Americans have faced due to the, to, to the application of stereotypes, particularly when a young man is behind the wheel. DWB features music by Susan Kander and a libretto by Roberta Gumbel, both Kansas City natives. They were moved by the events that followed the shooting of Michael Brown by police in neighboring Ferguson, Missouri, an event which the Department of Justice later characterized as resulting from a pattern of unlawful police conduct motivated by racial stereotyping. Certainly news media reported wide, widely on those events, but Ms. Gumbel, recognizing her role as a storyteller through music, wrote a personal narrative, not just describing, but evoking the experience of an African-American parent who, as their son approaches driving age, finds himself fraught with anxiety rather than celebrating their child's coming of age. In combining words and music, the music theater form allows for a mix of the concrete and the abstract, the explanatory and the emotional. What this art form does beautifully is allow a character not just to speak about an experience, but to speak out of it, allowing the listener to connect as one human being to another. Let's listen. Please join us for DWB. It plays just three performances, March 19th, 20, and 21 here at BPAC. But before you do, let's investigate just how current this story actually is. The Urban League of Greater Kansas City reported last November that black drivers in Missouri are 91% more likely to be pulled over by police than white drivers. And in terms of economics, education, and criminal justice, black residents of Kansas City were still separate and unequal. Join me now in welcoming Aldemara Romero, Dean of the Weissman College of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. He will moderate this evening's discussion on the politics of race in America. Thank you. Thank you.
Good day to everyone. This is another episode of the series Art Speaks Justice, which we have been conducting since last semester here at Baruch College. My name is Aldemaro Romero Jr. I am the Dean of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences. And today we have a panel of people with very diff different backgrounds who are going to tell us a little about their opinions on the issue of race in America. Uh, first, up to my right, is Mark Morial, who is the CEO and President of the National Urban League. Next is Professor uh, Shelley Eversley, uh, who is the, the, uh, the Interim Chair of the Black and Latino Studies uh, Department. And next to her is Professor Marcus Johnson, who is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. The issue of race in America has been ingrained in the history of this country from the very beginning. From the time the Europeans arrived here and the way Native Americans were treated, to slavery, to the wave of immigrations that we have witnessed here, from, first from Europe, then Latin America, and other places. Therefore, there is a big issue in the history of this country that have many different angles. And I'm going to show you here the cover page of the New York Times dated Wednesday, November the 5th, that is the day after Barack Obama was elected President of the United States. And the title says, Obama, Racial Barrier Falls in Decisive Victory. Immediately after that, people started to talk about colorblind America, the end of racial injustice, and all the like. But 12 years later, we are seeing one of the worst periods in American history when it comes to all kinds of bigotries, not only racial, but religious, uh, by country of origin, and everything else. So let me ask the panel, beginning with you, what happened? Well, first of all, good evening to everyone. Good to be with you, Dean, and to both uh, distinguished faculty members. First of all, the idea that President Obama's election ushered in post -racial, a post-racial era in American history or in American politics was a bogus assertion. Uh, the truth is, is that what President Obama's victory meant is that on that day and at, and at that moment, for many Americans, for many white Americans, race was not a barrier to voting for a highly qualified black man to be president of the United States. And I think it was disingenuous, I felt that way at the time, to suggest that simply, merely, as significant as it was in American history, and as joyous a day as it was, and as celebratory a mood uh, that I felt, that the, the president's election somehow meant that racism would disappear, that a colorblind America would abound. Uh, I think we witnessed the fact that American history is replete with uh, powerful steps forward followed by backlash. And what we witnessed in the administration uh, currently in office and the forces that elected this was a backlash uh, to the president, President Obama's election in many, many respects. So, I mean, it's hard to encapsulate it, uh, but racism to me is a disease that is ingrained in the American ethos. And I've always felt that it's our job as a generation to cure that disease, to eradicate that disease, uh, so that we can truly become uh, e pluribus unum, uh, so that we can truly become a nation that uh, is just and fair to all people. I'll say this finally. Uh, I think America has to be both colorblind and color conscious. Uh, because I think you cannot pursue justice. You cannot advocate for a level playing field of fairness without a consciousness of the role that race has and continues to play in American life. Professor Everson. I agree. <laughs> um, I think that one, one way we can, we can approach this um, tremendous moment when President Obama was elected and this tremendous moment that we are witnessing in our immediate is to think about the ways that, that race has, it, 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 it colors so many people's understanding of power so that when this multiracial black man arrives as the most powerful person in the United States, the perception that power is no longer white, which 
is a very color conscious definition of power when they recognize that, that power is no longer exclusively white, the backlash would follow. And what that means for the everyday person is the kinds of surveillances that have existed since the very beginning of the United States, which would be the kind of surveillances that make it dangerous for a black person to drive on a highway in Missouri or Texas or Maryland or New Orleans or for a black man to walk down his street in uh, Brooklyn without being stopped and checked to make sure that they are in the right place. This is very much what they did, slave patrollers did um, during another moment of American history and is continuing in different forms. Professor Johnson, Professor Eversley mentioned the word power. And I don't think a lot of people are really conscious about the uh, role played by power in all these relationships. In, in fact, when we look at or listen to the white supremacists, their favorite slogan is white power. Tell us a little bit about the, how that plays in the formula of understanding race in America. Oh, that's a, that's a huge question. Um, I mean, so when we think about what race is and how it affects politics, I mean, Oftentimes what we're discussing is that there's an imbalance of political resource and social power that allows for certain classes of people, uh, be it divided on race, be it divided on wealth, uh, to set the orders of the game or the rules of the game. And as that game begins to play itself out, an ideology builds around it. Uh, and so we see with institutions like slavery, for example, it wasn't that from that initial moment that you know, Europeans came in contact with Africans on the, uh, on the continent, they decided that these people were inferior, but it became a motivating logic to make that type of physical exploitation of people's bodies make sense and justifiable. Um, and so power, you know, as we think about racial inequality, as we think of you know, how difficult it is to dislodge you know, systems of inequality, part of that is because once people are in power, their interests are set and it's hard to move those. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Morial, as a president of the Urban League, uh, what we have witnessed in the, in the last few weeks in the political campaign in the Democratic Party. And we saw the firm, former mayor of New York, Mr. Bloomberg, uh, first apologizing for the stop and frisk policy, conveniently a few days before launching his political campaign. But that was a point that was really uh, slammed him in many ways, in many political circles. Why do you think that things so controversial like that, things that are obviously uh, biased against minorities, these policies are still being put in practice whether we talk about water uh, suppression and all the kind of other politics in this country? You know, I always thought, you know, I, uh, I was mayor of New Orleans. Uh, I ran a very successful police reform effort in the 90s. Uh, I had to tackle uh, 400 plus murders, significant levels of violence, significant levels of black on black violence. And we did it without resort to such tactics as stop and frisk. So when I talk about stop and frisk, I'm not talking simply as an activist. I'm speaking as someone who hired a police chief, participated in the design and execution of a highly successful uh, 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 police reform policy and a, a public safety and violence eradication policy and never really understood the logic of widespread stop and frisk in this, in this city. We always thought that it was number one, abusive, uh, number two, inefficient, uh, number three, uh, the kind of thing that would produce abundant backlash uh, in the community. It is important for people to recognize that what it took to stop, stop, and frisk in this city was a civil rights lawsuit. It required a courageous federal judge uh, when presented with a lawsuit by some highly talented lawyers to find that stop and frisk was racially motivated. Uh, and, and, and I think it was a, a, a foolish policy from the very beginning. And it did, it did affect and define uh, Mike Bloomberg's candidacy in many respects. But in, in, in all, my, my, my point of view is that what 
knocked the wind out of Mike Bloomberg's nascent presidential campaign was his performance in two debates. I thought his performance in both of those debates probably more than anything uh, knocked the wind out of his candidacy because he had made uh, some fairly significant progress in getting African-American mayors from around the country who in many respects may not have been really familiar with New York City to endorse his candidacy because of his relationships, because of his philanthropy, and because some of the commitments he made. Uh, so uh, I think stop and frisk, uh, and you ask why these policies continue to abound. Uh, and that, that's a very difficult question because one of the lenses that uh, what I think elected officials and policymakers should run policies through uh, is will they result in disparate impact or disparate treatment? Uh, do they have a uh, a racially discriminatory dimension uh, to them. Uh, what was interesting about Stop and Frisk, and this was shared with me by people who were close to the Bratton administration, is that wherever you had a large number of Stop and Frisk incidents, the popularity and the approval ratings of the New York City Police Department were very low. So it was an inverse relationship between, so anyone who knows anything about uh, law enforcement and public safety knows that uh, if the public does not trust, do not trust law enforcement, law enforcement is in the end of the day gonna be highly effective uh, because it requires trust and confidence. And what we did in New Orleans is we launched an aggressive community policing effort, uh, which was designed to be proactive, which was designed and you see some efforts in that regard being undertaken uh, here in New York today. So we, we can certainly uh, come back to this, but it was always a, a failed policy. It was never a popular policy, but it took litigation uh, to, to, to stop it in its tracks. And I think, but for that litigation, that policy might still, you know, might still be around in, in a big way today. Professor Eversley, uh, I have spoken with a number of uh, African American women who have adult or teenage children who were the victims of a stop and frisk. And they were surprised when they told me that they found out just by chance that their children had been victims of that policy. What do you think is there in the mind of the victims of this particular policy that makes it feel like they cannot even share that type of things with their parents. What is the psychological effect of that? I would say, oops, sorry. <laughs> I would say that there's this assumption that um, children grow up with safety, that this is some kind of an inalienable right. And parents, when they have children, what they want most is that their child is safe. And if you are a child and you go home and you have to tell your mother that you are not safe, that, that the threats to your mobility are constant, they're every day, they're commonplace, is a real assault, not just to the person who experiences it, but to the very assault to the very notion that a parent can protect her child, or mother can protect her child. Um, in Driving While Black, the, the, the performance we'll see next week, this is the thing, right? This is the moment when a mother, a parent, anyone who loves someone who's black has to recognize the fact that racial terrorism has made it impossible for a mother to expect her child can move around in this world with safety. Professor Johnson, as a political scientist, I wanted to ask you, uh, certainly we made a lot of progress in the 60s when it came to legislation. Civil Rights Act is one of the prime examples of that. But yet it seems that the political system in this country hasn't changed that much. Uh, all likelihood is the next president of the United States is going to be an older white male. So what kind of reforms do we need in this country in order to change that in a dramatic or substantial way? Sure. Um, so the, uh, 
you know, one of the crowning achievements of the Trump administration in 2018 was the First Step Act, uh, which was kind of this bipartisan moment where Democrats came together in, uh, in the House, the Republicans in the Senate, and with the White House uh, to really do some very marginal uh, reforms to uh, the prison industrial complex. Um, essentially, you know, making it uh, easier for prisoners to access programs to reduce recidivism. And I think one of the bigger moments that we're likely to, to miss is that it's very easy to look at these proximate causes of um, mass incarceration and think that if we change these things, if we you know, eliminate bail, uh, if we reduce sentencing disparities, uh, if we you know, reduce these uh, things that reduce you know, kind of ju judicial discretion at the moment of sentencing, that then we'll address this problem. But it's not addressing the root causes. And so we, you know, we kind of look, since the 1960s, we really haven't seen reforms to legislation that have addressed root causes of racial inequality, over-policing, and violence. And so I think that's why we can look at the 60s and think of this as a crowning moment and look at today and ask how, how have we gotten here. It's very easy. We react to things that you know, draw news, that draw attention. And it's much easier to kick the buck on you know, systems of historical racial oppression and inequality. That's why we still don't have a commission to study reparations in the US, for example. Do you find kind of shocking, as I did, that there has been legislation being proposed for over a century, making lynching a federal crime, and still that common sense legislation, as many politicians will say, hasn't passed. Why do you think is that? I think that. Uh, that anti-lynching legislation uh, and the anti-lynching movement gave rise to the creation of the NAACP, uh, the National Urban League, and the civil rights activism of the early 1900s, and lynching was a considerable issue in the United States. I think after World War II, uh, the civil rights advocacy then began to focus on public accommodations, ending segregation, uh, ending segregated schools and public facilities. I think the agenda to some extent shifted and it became, an, it was a surprise to me that there is no law that makes lynching a crime, specifically makes lynching a crime. There's no question uh, and no doubt about that. But I wanted to say this, you know, the 1960s, was an interesting period where activism and practical politics came together. The activism of the 1960s uh, led to important legislative successes. 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 64, 1965, the Voting Rights Act, the 1966 anti-poverty programs uh, and the Great Society programs in 1968, uh, Fair Housing Act. Uh, and then there was, and people need to really, really, there was the election in 1968, the election in 1968, and Richard Nixon won a narrow victory. One of the primary reasons he was able to win a narrow victory is that there was a third party candidate in that race. They got 12% of the vote and won a number of states in the Electoral College. Anybody remember his name? George Wallace. George Wallace ran and pretty much because many of these southern states were probably going to vote Democratic anyway, ended up. So what it did is you had the backlash of the Nixon years. Then you had the backlash of the Reagan-Bush years. And in many respects, the momentum of the 1960s uh, 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 was, was stalled, and the African-American political movement, particularly in the South, moved from activism after the Voting Rights Act to seeking to elect people to public office, to state legislatures, to city councils, to mayor's offices, in those states where you had judicial officers. The strategy, to some extent, uh, changed because there was a sense that you could achieve success by and through public office. I think now there's a, there's, a, there's a growing awakening that activism is an essential element of change. But that activism has to have objectives. 
It has to have a result. It has to have a goal. It has to be a strategy. Uh, and, and that it has to be tied to uh, achieving success. So I'm a very big believer that it is a false choice to choose activism or elected politics. I think all of it are important. Activism or elected politics or litigation or thought leadership, whatever you want to call it. I think all of these things are essential to a movement for progressive change uh, in this country. Talking about activism, I wanted to ask Professor Eversley, as a teacher of African American literature, to what extent do you think that the most famous writers of African American heritage in this country have been activists through literature, or to what extent they actually have been changing the themes of the emphasis through times based on the political circumstances? I understand African American literature as an art form that practices resistance and rebellion. And I argue and teach that African American literature is a very important creative site for anyone who wants to understand the ethical crises that define this, this country. Um, I think that with literature, all kinds of literature and all kinds of art forms, um, the, the craft is to be able to make something visible that the eye would normally not be able to see or that the mind might not be able to sort of comprehend. And so in that way, art affords, and this, I mean art, not just by African Americans, but the kind of art that is not just about aesthetics, but also about politics, is about making visible some of the very feelings, controversies, ethical questions that we can't just understand by numbers or by data. And so, yeah, in that way, I'd say African-American literature is about resistance from Toni Morrison to James Baldwin to Frederick Douglass to Alice Walker to Gwendolyn Brooks. They're always thinking about the ways to represent black humanity, black power, and here I mean agency, um, black lives as they matter, even against an institutional framework that denies the fact that black humanity is equal to any other humanity. My next question for Professor Johnson is, I recently read some comments made by historians, both white and black, about the time of independence in this country. That came the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, as long as you're white, of course, but that they argue that one of the reasons behind the independence movement was that there were already rumors coming from England that they were going to abolish slavery. And most of those participants in there were slave on owners. So my question to you is, to what extent these type of things, consciously or unconsciously, uh, move certain political uh, actions in one way or another? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that we're constantly faced to grapple with is to what extent are these things intentional? Like, we kind of have this, you know, desire to really get into the minds of, you know, our framers and get into the minds of our politicians today and, you know, really determine, like, is this person racist? <laughs> and that's kind of our metric for determining whether whatever gets produced out of that is problematic. And I think, you know, to, to take even a, a step back, I mean, really the root of that is it's economic. Um, and so kind of instead of really trying to get into the minds of exactly what it was that they were trying to do with independence, I think it's important to look at the function and the product. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, it simplifies the, the conversation a lot because you don't have to get into a debate with someone that, you know, vigorously loves American history and try to revise their image of George Washington, for example, who was a slave owner. Um, instead, just talk about the function, talk about the product. Uh, and the product was that America became independent, became one of the largest, uh, you know, had the largest slave owning population in the world, um, and built its economy off of that. And I think at the end of the day, if those institutions grew out of that system, that's what we have to reckon with, not whether founders were racist. As a former mayor of New Orleans, uh, you had to deal with practical issues on a daily basis. To what extent do you think that even people who call themselves non-racist 
actually are unconsciously so, not with a bad intention, but in the kind of the products that they generate, the way they interact with people of color. I mean, there's always the fact, right? Always the fact that you're dealing with subconscious uh, uh, races. I think the thing about what is always interesting to me is how, how people can express, uh, carry out, support racial bias and be unaware of it or be absolutely obstinate about the fact that their actions or their words or their views have a racially biased dimension. Because race is an extremely tricky and difficult thing. But what I tried to do uh, as, a, as, as a leader of a city that was multiracial and which was slightly majority African American uh, is, is, is recognize that people are not one dimensional, right? White people are not one dimensional, black people are not one dimensional. Uh, no one is one dimensional and to see people in a single dimension uh, paralyzes your ability to move the ball by finding common ground. As an elected official, it was important for me to, to, to one, stand for something, but it was important for me to get things done. You know, I was hired to make things happen, not to just stand for something as a mayor. People want a safer city. They want potholes filled. They want parks and playgrounds that operate and are not dirty. They want a fire department that's going to show up. They want garbage that's picked up. They wanted a curbside recycling program. They always also wanted po policies that were going to promote equity, equity in employment. Equity in contracting was a huge issue uh, when I served as mayor of New Orleans. And so trying not to judge people in a one-dimensional fashion uh, was, was something that I did. I, I, I recognized, I, you know, I grew up in the South. Uh, I was born in 1958. Uh, I went to the schools in New Orleans as they were first integrated. And so understanding race and racism and uh, people that had both conscious and subconscious uh, uh, racial bias was something you live with and you learn to work with. If it frustrates you and gets you angry all the time, you'll be ineffective. You won't be successful, you won't get anything done. If you ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist, you'll also be ineffective in pursuing the aims of fairness uh, and justice and the eradication of, uh, of racial di discrimination in society. So you know, it's, a, it's a difficult and it's a tricky thing, but I try to find in building a coalition uh, people who I could, and many times, the coalitions I built were built around single issues. I could build a coalition around this issue. I could build a coalition around that issue. But I couldn't get the same people that work together on this issue sometimes to work together on that issue or on a third issue uh, because of the changing dynamics. And so I accepted that as a given in trying to get things done. I couldn't build a permanent, everlasting coalition that somehow was ideologically aligned and pure. Uh, sometimes you look outside of politics and you think of it that way, but local politics is very different than what happens on a national level in communities, maybe not speaking about New York specifically, but speaking about most communities in the country. And so, you know, that's to a great extent what I face. You, you have to understand it is, it, is, it is a fact of life and you have to deal with it, you have to confront it, you have to fight it, you have to work through it. Uh, and, and that's the aim of being, uh, I think, in the practical arena uh, of, of politics in America. You know, people want you to stand for something. Now, Congress is a different place. All they do is vote. When you're at the local level, you're supposed to make things happen. Now, you can't get away with just pressing, casting a vote. No disparagement to people in Congress. But the truth of the matter, being a legislator is very different than being an executive. Professor Eversley, in the fewer and fewer bookstores that we can visit in person, not virtually. You gotta go to Amazon, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, we, when we go to the literature area, we see things, fiction, nonfiction, and then an area reserved for African-American literature. 
My question to you is, does that help or hurt? Because some people in Italy will say, white people, particularly African-American literature, this is not for me. So I want to get to your take on, on that. I've taught American literature courses um, with American writers, and American writers are black, they are Asian, they are Native American, they are Latinx, they are all kinds of things. Um, so I think that's probably the commercialization to, to, to offer that kind of segregation at the bookstore. Um, but more importantly, as long as you read the book, and I think more important to this conversation about driving while black and the kinds of practices of racial terrorism that continue in the 21st century in the United States and around the world is that people don't read. They don't read. I, 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 I won't even say enough. Um, <laughs> they don't read. And they doesn't read their phones, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and now people, people talk to their phones and they tell their phone what to type to send to someone else. Um, and this is, a, this is a challenge because it's a challenge about attention. I know that a lot of people don't like to read, but they also don't have the discipline anymore. And I say this and, you know, they don't have the discipline to actually pay attention to the details. And so when we talk, when our students are talking about, about whether this is American literature or African American literature, it's more, more important to pay attention to to the text, to pay attention. How, how long can people sit still? And I think actually that the absence of bookstores or the disappearance of bookstores and books is also one way to ensure a citizenry that is ill-equipped to, to recognize the systems that are in front of them, the ways in which the government and other kinds of institutions are disempowering individual people, because if you do not know how the Constitution works, you will not notice when they dismantle it. If you do not know that racism um, from driving while black is not a new phenomenon, then you have no means to resist it or understand its lasting effects. So that take us to the next question that has to do with uh, legislative process and political processes in this country uh, essentially is how we can educate the people who have that power to vote one way or another in that legislation to see things more clearly. Do you feel that a large proportion of our politicians today are uneducated about even the, the American political system and they are just kind of a puppets of other interests? that happen in, in everyday uh, politics. <clears throat> so again, to, to clarify, I'm not an expert in American politics, so this is coming from a person that studies Latin America, uh, but lives in this environment. I absolutely think that politicians are ignorant. I mean, they're people. Um, and I think one of the mistakes that we make is that we kind of develop this savior complex that someone comes along, they can tell policies that we like, or they give a message that we get excited about, and just like with Obama, we put our hopes in them, and then we see things collapse. You know, a person isn't a solution to a system. And so in this, you know, kind of way of thinking about, you know, our legislators, absolutely, we need to use activism to, you know, remind them of who we are, and that we're here, and that we're watching. Um, and that we also know that the work isn't just gonna be done in, in DC, that the work is being done in our communities. Um, and so, you know, kind of to, the, to this point of activism, I think, you know, one thing that we saw in the 60s is that we had two extremely strong political parties that today, I don't know that we're in that moment. We have very polarized parties, but I don't know that we had strong parties. And so to expect that, you know, activists will join with parties and then we'll see policy get produced out of that. I don't know if we have a moment where the Senate will pass anything. Um, and so I think now it's very much necessary and people are starting to do the work that it's like, if we want to see change, we're going to do it. Um, and so, you know, a lot of criminal justice reform, for example, is happening outside of the laws of, con or the laws of Congress, happening outside of city halls, happening outside of legislators, they're happening in communities. And so I think this is kind of our new political moment that we need to recognize that outside and uh, beside political institutions exist civic and social institutions. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so I done. wouldn't paint with a broad brush that all politicians are ignorant. Because I think people, people in political office, like all people. You can't 
paint with a broad brush. Because I, there have been some people who are extremely committed, uh, have given their life to public service, uh, uh, bring a great deal of intelligence. Also, want to clarify that was not a shot at, at you. Yeah, I'm just thinking because it's your mouth. Making the discussion fun. <laughs> but, but, but I do think that we also have to recognize the following. Let me talk about New York. New York, and I've been here about 15 years, when it comes to its local politics, is very unusual to me. Why is it unusual? Because it has low voter turnout. Low voter turnout. Elections around here have 10, 15, 20% of the vote. That turns out, in quote, the most progressive city in the United States. So here's how politicians think. And a politician in New York told me this, said, you see, here's the deal. When it comes time for me to run, I know who's gonna vote. And I have to win those who vote. And sometimes people who are, we're at a town hall meeting, who are in here making some very valid points on the community, they're not going to vote. So they have no say at all over whether I survive or not. New York has low vote. Let me con compare and contrast. Uh, I ran, I, was, I, I could serve two terms as mayor. First time I got elected mayor in New Orleans, 70% of the people turned out. 70% of the people turned out. Second time I ran against token opposition, 60% of the people turned out. And that was the lowest voter turnout in a mayor's race in 30 years. High participatory voter turnout. So what happens when you get high voter turnout? You get more people of color, you get more young people, you get more people who are marginalized, who participate in the process. And so what does it do? It gives you more standing to pursue progressive or aggressive policies. And that is the point. And I think people, we need to understand that public policy is not made by Washington alone. For example, the criminal justice system in the United States is a feature and creature of state legislatures. State courts, that's where 80% of the cases are tried. That's where 80% of the incarcerated people are. That's where most people uh, who are tied up in the system are. So change can come about through activism and pressure at the state legislative level. So these low turnout state legislative and state senate races, where people say, hmm, I don't know if I'm going to participate. I don't know what difference they make. A great deal of difference can be made uh, with respect to those races. New York City has public financing of campaigns. People can run and not be beholden to any wealthy special interest groups because you can get public financing. Yet with public financing, you still have low voter turnout. So it's a little bit of a call to action you know, here in New York City. Uh, and I don't quite understand it because candidly, I come from a tradition in the South where my grandparents could not vote. My parents could vote. My mother talks about the test she was given when she first went to register to vote in the 1950s, where the person who took her application asked her what color her eyes were. And when she said her eyes were black, she said, no, your eyes are brown, you failed this test. And so I come from that tradition. So coming from that tradition, which was ingrained in me by an earlier generation means I look at voting whether I love or like the system, love or like the candidates, is something I gotta do. I just gotta do it, and I'm gonna do it in rain and snow, and if I look at the candidates and I don't like them, I will hold my nose and vote for the least offensive one. But that's my, I don't expect other people to share that kind of uh, passion about voting, it's that I come from a region in the country and come from a tradition where it was denied. 
for such a long period of time. And because it was denied, uh, I feel like I have an obligation and a responsibility. I'm not saying that everyone should have that, but I think those of us that have that story should share it so people will understand. It's not something I read in a history book. It's not something I heard about in a movie. It's not eyes on a prize. It's something that my parents and my grandparents and the people in my neighborhood said, son, let me tell you how it was. Let me explain it to you so you know. Let me make sure you never forget what we had to deal with and what you kind of owe us when you think about these sorts of issues. So I really think there's so much potential power that the people have in New York and in New York City. And the final thing I'll say is, and this is a story, a real story, when the police uh, killings of unarmed black men reached a pitch. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice. I had a young activist brother come up to me and said, you know what, I'm very frustrated. I've been to five marches and I've been out here for eight months. I think I've sent out 3,000 tweets. He said, but I'm frustrated. I said, why are you frustrated? He says, because nothing's changed. I said, change is not going to come easy. You can't think that it's an episodic thing, that you show up a couple of times, you engage in social media a couple of times, and automatically there's going to be change. Look at the night. People talk about the 1960s. Do people realize that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was introduced in the Congress in 1947 and was held up by a filibuster until 1964? Do people realize that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mirrors the Civil Rights Act of 1871, which was struck down by the United States Supreme Court in 1883? That uh, these things are longstanding, and so generations have to realize we're in for work, we're in for fight. You take an issue like immigration reform, which we've not talked about, that is a hard, long battle in this country. Uh, to be able to do it because of the undercarriage of racial exclusion and racism that undergirds the discussion in 21st century America. So, got to be in it. You can't be frustrated. You know, uh, Gil Scott Heron, you all heard of Gil Scott Heron? Who's not too old, too young? Gil Scott Heron, right? The revolution, what? Will not be televised. The revolution is not going to be on the internet, it's going to happen in real lives, in real time. In your communities. Professor Everly early, earlier mentioned that people don't read now. They don't buy books, don't read books. And I was wondering to what extent we can assert that that's the product of our system of education. Let's take the case of New York City. Some people may be shocked about this, but New York City has one of the most uh, divisive, uh, segregated school systems in the country. And in a, in a way, it's like thinking that the whole idea of separate but equal is actually being still practiced in New York City. What do you think we can do about that? Read books? <laughs> well, we should read books, but I, you know, I'm looking up and I see students in the room and it's one really important for them to know that all of that glory of the 1960s was led by people who were young. People who were born probably in the 1940s after their parents and the world witnessed an atomic bomb and a holocaust and all kinds of big shifts in, in sort of the way people understand terror and violence. And they grew up and they became adults in the 60s and they decided that they were going to try to change the world and they put themselves on the line. And here it's not just black students. Um, there were college students, you know, who, who, who wanted to avoid being drafted to the war. There were college students who, who wanted their right to be able to have control over their reproductive futures. And they got together and they sought to change the world. And I think that is really important because that also happened at school. 
right? Because they read something that sparked them. And so when I think about segregation and I think about educational inequality, I think about how that reinforces the kinds of inequalities that follow people throughout their lives. And then I think about our students, the people who are in this room right now, who maybe didn't go to the best high school, or maybe don't live in the fanciest neighborhood, but they have everything they need because they've chosen to study. And whatever that study might be, and this gets back to my question about attention, because it's about being able to understand that it's a long fight, it's a long struggle. Being able to understand the terms of their own survival, right, because in lots of ways, if you are broke, if you are, if you are of all kinds of backgrounds, they don't expect us to survive. That's why getting away with racial profiling and driving while black and exclusion acts, et cetera, continue. Because somehow, someone on the other side of that argument thinks that they're going to win, and then we don't let them. And I think that always comes back to the book, because of course I'm a professor and I love books. Um, but with my students, you know, it, it becomes one of those moments you show them that the keys to the kingdom, the keys to their future are actually inside of a footnote somewhere, or they're inside of a paragraph, or a text, or a lecture from one of their nerdy professors that could spark them to actually not just think, but also act, and as you say, to do it with conviction for a longer term. Now you will talk about the audience that we have here today. <laughs> we started to receive some questions from the audience to you guys, and the first one is addressed to Dr. Johnson. And the question is the following. You spoke about the roots of racial injustice. To what extent do you believe that the ideology of prison abolition would be effective in eliminating these root causes? What ab about anti-capitalism as a solution? Yes. Um, sorry, the mic didn't like that, I guess. Um, absolutely. Uh, and one of the things that you know, I was thinking about in, in preparing for this is that if you really want to think about the roots of slavery and the roots of inequality and the roots uh, in, our, in our criminal justice system, don't just look at the US, but look at the Americas where bodies were traded from Africa to Brazil in mass, to Panama in mass, to Colombia in mass, and you see Jamaica in mass, and you see the same structures. And so if you really want to kind of think about you know, what it means to abolish a system of inequality, it means kind of speaking to those roots and looking at how institutions like the carceral system today, which uh, Professor Michelle Alexander did beautifully in her book, um, the, the New Jim Crow, trace those links. I mean, I think that you know, politicians need more, uh, you know, students need more, professors need more. We need to focus on history. And we really need to be able to tell our history and look at where our institutions come from and if we really want to understand their structure and, their, and, their, and the products that they produce. So yes, I think that abol abolition uh, and you know, a, a, a real serious reapproach to our you know, embrace of capitalist institutions is necessary uh, because we recognize that these things are, are historical, they're ideological, and we were you know, brought up in an institution to believe that these are the only alternatives, but they're not. Um, and so this is why, in addition to politicians, and in addition to voting, in addition to doing your institutional duties, you also have to do your work outside of the institutions. Uh, and that means reading. Um, but that also means figuring out what's going on in your community and how can you be involved. Here's another question which is quite interesting, so please feel free to jump um, and to answer this question. What are your thoughts on white fragility? I have an answer. Okay. <laughs> well, one thing is that equality, I, I, I said this is a metaphor, speaking of metaphors, it, uh, I, I went to a, a gay bar, and if you've ever been to a gay bar where there's lots of men, usually going to the ladies' room is really easy, right? Um, if they have a ladies' room, there's no line, it's really clean, and it's great. Um, but then if you go to a gay bar or a party and all of a sudden the bathrooms are all gender neutral and everyone has to stand in line, then you find out all the women in the gay bar all of a sudden are sort of like, why do I have to stand in line? That's just not very many women. But in fact, you stand in line because this is what equality looks like. If everyone uses the same toilet, then, and there's a 
crowd, you have to wait in line. And I think when we get back to this idea of white fragility, I mean, one of the crises is gets back to power, right? If, if equality actually happened, it means that VIP access for white people disappears and they too have to stand in line. Um, and that would make people fragile because if you're used to VIP access your whole life and all of a sudden you have to go general admission or regular admission like everyone else, then of course it's going to feel like you are under attack. And of course it's going to make you feel fragile, like you're losing something, when in fact, yep, you are losing something. You're, use, you're losing your privilege. Um, and if you advocate for equality, then equality means that everyone has the same access to the bathroom, um, but everyone also has the same access to power, which means that sometimes we have to wait in line. The only thing I'd add, and this is important, the cause for racial justice has always had white allies throughout history and across the board. At the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin was an abolitionist. And there was a cadre of people at the US Constitutional Convention who were anti-slavery. They were not so dead set passionate about it that they drew a line in the sand, no doubt. But they were anti-slavery and they were abolitionists. So whether you talk about John Brown, or you talk about a great jurist like Earl Warren, you talk about a president like Lyndon Johnson, who despite a history uh, in his prior life, signed the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, those are prominent. So the cause for racial justice in this country is not a black only cause. It is a multi-racial cause. Those who want racial justice, those who want fairness. And so having white allies who are educated and understanding and willing to be advocates in the battle is very, very important. And what I try not to do is, I try not to look at, I understand the institution of white racism and white privilege, but I try not to, and I do not, uh, categorize people with a broad brush, simply and solely based on their race. And I think we have to, just like in the 1840s and the 1850s, and if you read books on Frederick Douglass about this, Manhattan was loaded with black slave catchers. Uh, if you no history. Brooklyn was a different place. It was much more abolitionist oriented. And the commercial interest and the interest in Manhattan. So you had African Americans who were trying to catch blacks. 12 Years a Slave is all about that. Uh, catch African American blacks and send them back to slavery in the South. So while we understand institutional racism, allies are not automatically identified by color of their skin. Well, with those words, we are finishing our round table today. It wasn't very round, it was actually linear, but I think equally effective. I want to thank Mr. Mark Morial, Professor Shirley Eversley, and Martin Johnson. See you next time. <laughs>